Hello, this talk is about something called planned obsolescence. That might be a term you have not come across before, so firstly I'll define it with examples to illustrate the issue. Then I'll look briefly at the historical development of planned obsolescence. Then I'll explain why it has been described as an economic problem for the consumer. And finally, I'll outline the arguments that suggest that it may in fact be more of an environmental problem and how that problem is slowly being dealt with. So firstly, a definition. Obsolete means out of date or too old. So from a product or manufacturer's point of view, planned obsolescence means planning for the product to become out of date. A couple of examples should make that clearer. If your parents are anything like my parents, they'll often say something like, oh, they don't make them like they used to. My parents say that quite a lot. You know, things that we buy now are not made to last quite as long as they were 30 or 40 years ago. If you think about televisions, for example, when I was a kid growing up, the TV sat in the corner of the room for many, many years. If it broke, somebody came to fix it and it then worked again like new for another few years. Nowadays, if your television breaks, you might take it to the shop and be told, no, it's not economical to fix it or it's not fixable. So the TV gets thrown away and you buy a new TV and they're not really that expensive and it's probably a lot better than the one you've just thrown away. iPads and iPhones are other examples. You know, the iPhone is now on its uh, 11th, I think, edition. So Apple update their phones and their iPads and things every year or two to make them better. Uh, people flock to the shops to buy them. There's probably nothing really wrong with the previous version, but the new version is better, so people want one. And the question is, what happens to the old phone? Well, maybe they get sold on, or maybe they get thrown away. So this idea that we make things that are either out of date or that they break within a year or two, it's called planned obsolescence. I hope those examples give you a clear idea of what it is. So let's think about the, uh, the history of planned obsolescence now. We might think of this term as being quite new, typified by Apple products, but actually it's not. It was coined in 1932 by a guy called Bernard London, who wrote an article called Ending the Depression Through Planned Obsolescence. The idea of Mr. London was that if people if people, if, if things were not built to such a high quality, they would not last such a long time and therefore people would need to buy more things as the things they had broke. And he thought that this process of buying more would help to end the US depression in the 1930s. Looking at the history, the principle of planned obsolescence was put into practice on a large scale for the first time um, with the formation of some light bulb manufacturers coming together. And this was called at the time the Phoebus Cartel. And this was in 1924. These light bulb manufacturers, namely Osram, Philips, Tungstram and General Electric, uh, this group of manufacturers, which we can call a cartel, they agreed to fix their prices for light bulbs so that no, none of those manufacturers had to worry about the competition from other manufacturers. And they secretly signed a commitment pledging to each other that their light bulbs would only be designed and constructed with a life expectancy of no more than 1000 hours. Now, obviously, if your light bulb blows, you've got no light in the room, so you have to buy a new bulb. So this idea to limit the life expectancy means that more light bulbs will be made and more will be bought 
and thus it keeps these manufacturers in business. Now this Phoebus cartel met its demise in 1939 when the Second World War broke out um, and at that time manufacturers of light bulbs in Scandinavia decided to make their own manufacturing cheaper so the lights became cheaper for everybody. So that's the, uh, the first example of um, planned obsolescence there. Uh, let's turn now to the effect of planned obsolescence on the consumer and the possible economic side effects of that. There's a researcher called Roland Strauss who wrote about the subject extensively in 2009. In reviewing the evidence he says that popular books argue that goods are made to break and he describes firms as, to quote Vance in 1960, merely waste makers who push consumption by producing goods with planned obsolescence. And that was in 1960. Lord knows what Vance would think about the amount of waste we produce nowadays. On the surface, as a consumer, you would be rightly annoyed that manufacturers make their products with a limited life expectancy because it means that you have to buy that thing more often. From the manufacturer's point of view, the argument for planned obsolescence is that the product with a shorter life means that they sell more products. Now Strauss in 2009 argues that this reduced life expectancy uh, can actually be good for consumers because it strengthens the producers, the manufacturers incentives to provide adequate quality in other areas. Uh, in other words, if you lose the quality of the product lifetime, you have to gain quality in other areas. So if you buy something and you're not satisfied with it, when it breaks, you'll not purchase the same thing again, you'll go to a competitor. If on the other hand, you're happy with how well the product works, when you need to buy another one, you might well stay with the same manufacturer. So quality is two essential traits, the length of use and the quality of use. Um, let's look at a fairly simple example to illustrate this. The razor, the simple act of shaving for men and women, I guess. When I started to shave many years ago, there were two metal blades on my razor. And then a few years later, there were three blades. And now there are five blades. There's also a lubricant on it um, and other little things that do something. Um, I don't know what they do exactly, but there are these other little things. The razors are pretty expensive, yes, but the shave that you get from a razor with five blades and this, these other things, it's a very smooth shave. It's, it's a closer shave than with two blades and because there are five blades, it lasts longer. And thus I would agree with Strauss that quality does play a large role when we're buying stuff. I use Gillette razors. If the quality of the shave was poor, then I wouldn't buy Gillette. I'd move to another pro producer. Um, so I think we can see that Strauss's argument is quite strong. Quality has other traits, not just life expectancy. Let's turn now to my final point, uh, that is that planned obsolescence is an environmental problem. In addition to the problem of product longevity is the problem of waste that is created when things are thrown away. A researcher called Maycroft in 2009 argued that planned obsolescence is an environmental problem you know, the TV breaks and it goes straight into the rubbish, it goes straight into landfill sites because it's not effective to repair the TV. And there's not enough value in the broken product to sell it on or to repair it. Um, and as you know, so many things are made of plastic nowadays. The plastic that we use is not degradable and it damages the earth when it's thrown away. It's not recyclable like metal or wood. And in some countries, the, the poorest people in society, 
they might even strip out some of the precious metals from these old electrical appliances and then sell that metal. Um, I, telephones particularly have quite a lot of very expensive precious metal in them nowadays. The kind of thinking described by Maycroft that a broken product is just thrown away and replaced is slowly falling out of favour. Um, recently, the European Union has introduced a law about the ability to repair certain household appliances, for example, washing machines. Kitchen appliances, like washing machines, usually come with a two-year warranty. So any problems in the first two years has to be fixed by the manufacturer. However, many people find that very soon after that two-year warranty period ends, they encounter a problem with their appliance and the manufacturer is not responsible for it. At that time, it can be very difficult to either find someone who is willing and able to fix the problem, or indeed, if you can find someone, that the person has great difficulty in sourcing the necessary parts. And even if those two issues are solved, the cost to repair the product might be so high in comparison to a new product that it's not worth repairing it. It's not economically viable. Uh, for example, washing, machi wash washing machines use something called um, gaskets, which form a watertight seal so that water doesn't end up on the floor of your home. Now, gaskets do wear out because they get wet and they get hot. And under these new EU laws, the manufacturer must supply spare parts to professional appliance engineers who can fix the problems. Uh, this is an excellent example of the EU creating legislation that has a positive effect on people's lives, both economically and environmentally. So um, I guess Maycroft's concerns about the, the environmental problem are slowly being dealt with. So in summary, um, I think I would agree with Strauss, who I mentioned earlier, um, that planned obsolescence is perhaps not so much of an economic problem because goods have other qualities. And more importantly, as Maycroft argues, um, it's an environmental problem. And that is a problem that, that the world is starting to consider more and in the case of the EU, starting to legislate against this wastefulness. So um, although, yeah, we will continue to see planned obsolescence in our products, perhaps it will become less of a problem in the future. Thank you.